Hello. Uh, I'd like to have a short discussion now. It needs not to be long at all, but let's talk about how cases arise. And the thing I want to do through this lecture portion is just make you uh, very aware of the different ways in which cases get uh, resolved. Uh, state constitutional law cases get resolved. Obviously, because we're dealing with the state constitution, most of the cases we're talking about would be cases that reach the Florida Supreme Court, but not all. Quite a large number of our decisions will be also deci decided by the uh, district courts of appeal in Florida. And as we'll see, when we get to Article 5, uh, the district courts of appeal are the last uh, courts uh, to be uh, hearing cases unless there's some way to reach the Florida Supreme Court and the Florida Supreme Court uh, does not always take jurisdiction even of the things for which they can take jurisdiction. So uh, some of our cases are District Court of Appeal cases, but most of them will be Florida Supreme Court cases. But whatever court they're resolved in, uh, please pay attention to the jurisdictional issues about how the case arises. And the reason that you'll want to do this is that when you begin to think about filing a, a case, you'll want to know where you want to file it and what, what theory uh, you use to file the case. And so this is the kind of overview that hopefully will guide you as you begin to brief the cases uh, that you're assigned. So our objectives are today to look at the uh, at the, uh, the ways that the cases get to court and to begin to prepare students to understand the Florida cases uh, and their background procedurally and their background in terms of, of what can be achieved uh, by, uh, by litigation through the use of that uh, jurisdictional route. First of all, the major topics we want to talk about are advisory opinion, bond validation cases, extraordinary writs, uh, declaratory judgment, the criminal case, and the injunctive action. Those are the major ways uh, that uh, cases get uh, resolved that relate to Florida constitutional law, and I'd like to go through each of them very briefly. The advisory opinion, there are two categories of advisory opinions. One, uh, when a governor seeks advice on questions relating to his duties. Now, uh, we'll look at some cases uh, when we get to Article 5 uh, and, for that matter, Article 4, when we uh, look at the advisory opinion process, recognize uh, that we're dealing with something here that is not present in federal uh, cases. But we, the federal U.S. Supreme Court does not have authority to issue advisory opinions. Uh, so uh, this is a limited form of jurisdiction given to the Florida Supreme Court to give the governor advice about his duties under the Constitution. Again, we can get into some really interesting debates about uh, the scope of that authority to issue uh, opinions, and we'll see uh, uh, some cases where the court divides on that question. The second type of advisory opinion is in a very special area. It's the uh, provision that allows the Attorney General of Florida to seek uh, an advisory opinion relating to a proposed initiative amendment. And uh, at the point that the, uh, the uh, there have been sufficient signatures collected uh, uh, by the proponents of a constitutional amendment by initiative, the uh, Attorney General may go before the court and seek advice about uh, whether the, that initiative amendment uh, meets the constitutional requirements for an initiative amendment. And we'll see, uh, when we get to the amendments process, we'll see some very interesting litigation relating to that issue. Bond validation, pretty simple. Uh, when we get to Article 5, Section 3, 
we'll look more closely at this, but the, but the uh, Florida Constitution, the revision of Article 5, accomplished in 1972, gives the legislature authority to place bond validation uh, uh, appeals directly to the Florida Supreme Court. So what happens in Florida is that uh, where a unit of local government, for instance, is going to issue bonds, uh, they can go to a circuit court and file a bond validation proceeding. And when that uh, case is decided, uh, the appeal will not be to the District Court of Appeal for that district in which the bond authority uh, is sitting. Uh, instead, it'll go directly to the Florida Supreme Court. And the reasoning for this is that this way we get a consistent application of, uh, of bond law uh, in, in Florida uh, through the Florida Supreme Court decisions that will apply statewide. So uh, again, uh, as we look at the origin of our cases, we'll find a number of them uh, begin as bond validation cases. And in bond validation cases, uh, we have a very curious procedure. Bond validation cases are brought by the state attorney. Now, the state attorney is not sitting around the state attorney's office thinking about whether there's some bonds out there that uh, should be uh, validated. Indeed, uh, the bond validation uh, case is brought to the attorney general by bond counsel. And what bond counsel will do is look over the possible legal issues uh, in a bond validation and try to uh, raise as many of those issues as possible. Uh, and, uh, and so when the bond authorities go seek validation, the person on the other side is the state attorney. And so the state attorney uh, now uh, gets from bond counsel a brief, actually initially gets a pleading, uh, in which the uh, state attorney is asked to raise certain questions so that they can be resolved. So, so look at this strange procedure. It's, it's the lawyers who are representing uh, the, those who are trying to issue bonds are taking a case uh, to the Attorney General saying we're going to file this bond validation matter and we want you to defend it and when you defend it please raise all these questions uh, relating to our bonds so that they can be resolved. So this curious process, bond counsel files of pleadings, um, goes to the state attorney, gives the state attorney pleadings to file against themselves, and those go before a court. Um, when the proceedings are before the court, bond counsel goes back to the state attorney and says, here's a brief you may want to file. And most state attorneys file the brief that's being suggested by, by bond counsel. Uh, issues are raised, they're decided by the circuit court, and then they're appealed to the Florida Supreme Court so that we now have a matter of race judicata relating to these bonds. And it's in the interest of bond counsel to raise as many issues as possible. So an awful lot of the law that we're dealing with in state constitutional law uh, actually gets resolved uh, through bond validation proceedings. I don't like the process very much. I think it's, uh, uh, it's loaded with possible fraud, but that's our, that's our process and uh, that's the one uh, that we use. And as you read cases and you read bond validation cases, uh, read them with some understanding about what is actually going on. Um, in addition to uh, bond validation, we also have a number of possible extraordinary writs that can be adopted by, uh, can be basis of a jurisdiction in our courts, and we're going to see a number of these as we go through uh, the substantive uh, articles of the Florida Constitution. We'll see uh, habeas obviously is used in criminal cases uh, and can be used to raise constitutional issues. 
uh, mandamus, the writ to determine whether or not uh, someone, including a lower court, should be compelled to take certain action, whether a governor can be required to take action called for in the Constitution, the root of Corrento, uh, the question which asked uh, a, an official by what authority, by what warrant, uh, do you take certain action? So uh, uh, it is used on a number of occasions. There's a root of prohibition which says um, to, to someone uh, who's subject to the writ, uh, you should be prohibited from doing a certain act because it's forbidden by our Constitution. And um, other extraordinary writs include two. One, the writ of certiorari. Certiorari is a writ of review. When we get to Article 5, you'll understand that our Florida Supreme Court does not have the root of certiorari. It's the authority to take on review of a case that is not otherwise appealable uh, uh, to the court. And it's an authority that's exercised by a court uh, over a, a, a body that's subordinate to that court. So a lower court or administrative agency that's subject to the jurisdiction of the court, you can find certiorari decisions. And then there's a provision which we'll look at more closely. We'll get to Article 5 uh, and all writs authority, all writs necessary to the complete resolution of a case that gets complicated and we'll look at it when we get to Article 5. Um, in criminal cases, we basically are dealing with felonies that are prosecuted in the circuit court, but also uh, constitutional questions can arise as misdemeanors when prosecuted in the county court. Now, the appeal in the, the county court is normally from county court to circuit court. But uh, where a question involves a decision relating to constitutionality, there is a special provision that allows for review by the District Court of Appeal. And again, we'll get into all of this in more detail when we get into Article 5 and the jurisdiction of courts. Uh, injunction action is the way that a great number of constitutional questions get raised, frequently brought along with declaratory judgment action, is normally brought in the circuit court and then appeal uh, to the District Court of Appeal. Uh, large numbers of those cases arise in the First District Court of Appeal uh, sitting in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, for the reason that um, most of the state agencies are located in Tallahassee, and the venue statutes require uh, that, uh, that, that actions be brought against the state agency in the venue uh, where they're located. So although you will find some district court decisions relating to state constitutional issues and other DCAs, you're going to find that the first district court of appeal is uh, the court which has the largest numbers of these cases. Well, that's a quick review. It really is just uh, a notice to you that when you brief the cases that have been assigned to you or that, that you pick out uh, for sections of the, of the Florida Constitution for which you've been assigned to, to brief a case, that you pay attention to the jurisdiction. H how did the case uh, get before the court that is now considering that case. And so uh, in, your, in your briefs, always pay attention to that and uh, alert your fellow students to the lessons that are to be learned from within the case, not only about the decision on the substantive point of law, but you should also uh, indicate uh, for other students' benefit uh, how the case got to the court and what procedures were involved uh, in that process. Thank you very much, and we'll move on to other areas in our next lecture.